everyone, and welcome to The Right Track. Today, I'm interviewing Akila Robinson, the VP of Creative Services at Warner Records. She focuses on the hip hop and R&B roster. And in this role, she commissions music videos and oversees all other video content. She works closely with artists and their teams to execute visual campaigns. Hi, Akila. how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm good, doing well, thank you. Thank you for being on the show. Absolutely, thanks for having me, I'm excited. Nice, well, of course, um, you probably have some amazing things to share, so I'm really <laughs> excited to have this chat with you. Yes, um, for yes. starters, can we, can we just start with you telling us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yes, so my name is Akilah Robinson. I am the VP of Creative Services. I work at Warner Records. Um, I've been there about five years. Before Warner, I was at RCA Records where I started right out of college. Um, same thing, working in content creation, started as a temp and kind of worked my way all the way up there. Came out here, was, that was in New York and uh, now I'm out here in LA working at Warner. Um, it was a very interesting journey, you know, starting from the assistant role to, you know, now VP. I think it's really been a great way to see the whole landscape and to really just like understand this content creation process uh, from the side of a label. I've always wanted to work in music. You know, I am not musically inclined, <laughs> but I love, love, love music since like as far back as I can remember. And, you know, when I was a kid and teenager, MTV, VH1, BET were all at their height. So, you know, seeing music videos and just seeing artists and just seeing their full like visual presence was always like a thing for me. And I kind of stumbled into this content creation role, honestly. I wanted to work in either marketing or maybe management, but I ended up getting this temp job and it was awesome. Like I got to sort of talk to everybody at the label and I got to learn all the different things that happened and this sort of felt for me like it was a way to use my creative side, it's a way to use my business side and kind of bring the two together, work directly with artists, you know, as well as, you know, knowing to fall back into behind the scenes. And it's just been a journey and it's been really fun to just see the technology, the the ways we receive music, the way we the way we sell music and all those things kind of change over these last going on, I hate to say it, like 15 years <laughs> like I've been doing this. Uh, so, so yeah, it's a little bit of background on me. All right. That's awesome. There's something clicking. Um, oh, it might be my headphones moving. I'll try to hold them down here. Oh, okay. Is this better? Like going click, 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 click. <laughs> Is this better? Yeah. I thought maybe it was like a fidget spinner. Okay. <laughs> I hope not. So, okay, so Akila, you have a degree in the music industry, uh, business administration, and film. Um, so do you feel like you're combining all three of those? A hundred percent. I um, I went to school for music business. So when I was looking for schools, you know, I was looking for places where I, they had um, connections to labels or maybe radio stations and things like that. So I could sort of like puff daddy my way into the music industry, if you will. Um, but I ended up at University of New Haven and they had a music business uh, curriculum where, you know, we learned about the legal aspects, we learned about marketing aspects, we learned, you know, we had to learn an instrument. I took drums, that was a good time. Um, and, you know, really kind of understanding how this whole business and kind of machine behind artists comes together. And then once I started at RCA, about two or three years into that, I went to New York Film Academy because I was working in the content team and, you know, I wanted to understand what editors and what, you know, filmmakers, what producers were saying to me. And I also wanted to be able to speak their language. So I went to that course and, you know, it was about eight weeks kind of intensive course where I learned producing, learned a little bit about shooting, learned a little bit about lighting, you know, learned a little bit about how to put a crew together, what encompasses a crew so that, you know, I learned editing and, you know, that way, I can, you know, I'm not a master of any of those by any means, but, you know, I know enough that like when I'm talking to an editor and I'm giving notes or I'm talking to an artist and trying to understand their notes, I can be that sort of conduit and speak both languages because, you know, the music kind of came to me and then learning the business gave me that point of view. And then when I dove into content, I really needed to understand like the filmmaking point of view. So every day I use a little bit from all of those degrees for sure. That's awesome. I, I mean, you must have such a 
cool job um, working with all these artists. And like you said, you're not necessarily musically inclined, but you appreciate the music a lot. And you, um, your, your job, I think, basically is taking a creative vision from an artist or an artist's team and bringing that into uh you know your content the digital content and the videos and stuff so tell me about making a music video <laughs> it's a process for sure um but you know it really starts with the idea no i'm sorry let me back up it starts with the song and you know and really taking that minute to connect to the song and i think all parties involved have to do that so that would be obviously the artist and when they choose the single and why is this the single you know when does it need to come out you know is there a feature on it or not like all of those things you know ultimately play into the creative because you know if it's got to come out in three weeks then typically a super you know vfx heavy green screen or you know crazy computer generated thing that takes a lot of time usually can't happen you know, but, or if they're a great performer, but maybe the feature artist is brand new and we're not sure how they're gonna react or how that chemistry is gonna be. It's sort of like, okay, what's the best position we can put these two artists in so that they both look amazing. We bring the song to life and you know, all of the things that a music video is supposed to do. So it starts with sort of like all the elements of the song. And then, you know, if the artist has an idea or if they don't, I have to sort of start from that starting point and if they have an idea that like they're stuck on and it's something that they want to do then it's really my job to find the right director and production company to bring that to life you know someone who knows how to work with an artist someone who knows how to you know not necessarily co-direct but kind of take the vision add their own add what they do to it but still maintain you know the artist's goals and what the artist wants to do if the artist has zero idea what they want to do and it's just like just tell me when to show up tell me when to <laughs> tell me what i need to wear then i've got to find a director who's strong enough to you know come up with a vision and really you know stick to it because that same artist that had no idea before once the idea starts coming together has every tweak every change or let's try this or what about this or can we do that you know and a director who can again, listen and implement what would work, but also stand behind the ultimate idea so that we don't just have like a hodgepodge of footage at the end of the day that doesn't turn into anything. Gotcha. So, yeah. you know, I really kind of liken myself as like the executive producer on the label side, because obviously, you know, the production company has that executive producer, but it's sort of my job to make sure we're on time, you know, on the actual shoot day, but throughout pre-production, post-production, and just kind of making sure it all flows together, as well as we stay on, on task. Because as we all know, you know, artists are very artistic. And so, you know, you get there and you see this camera that can do this cool thing. It's like, oh, let's do 50 takes of this. This looks so great. And it's sort of like, well, we don't need 50, but <laughs> let's get some great ones and then we can move on and we can do the next thing. And sort of just like massaging that, that situation along and making sure that we don't kind of get stuck overshooting something or that we don't get stuck by undershooting something and making sure that, you know, as creative as everyone's being, there's still someone there who's kind of like, okay, either we have to move on or I don't think we have this yet, or do we all think we have this now and let's go. So right. it's, you're it's, running the, you're running the show basically running it, you know, from, from sometimes more in the forefront, sometimes in the background, but again, it depends on, you know, what the team is and, and who we're working with, but yeah, it's definitely so that sort of like center cog in the wheel. Can I ask, um, do you own, do you work with established artists only, or do you work with some of the new artists that are just getting added to the label? Um, definitely both. And, you know, we're in an interesting situation at Warner where it's, we're in the middle of like rebuilding, right? When I started, they were taking a dramatic shift into sort of more hip hop and R and B and, you know, coming out of like that pop and rock legacy that Warner has, um, which was one of the reasons why I was brought over to sort of, you know, speak to these new artists and kind of bring that point of view by, you know, understanding what directors to bring in and who to work with and all those different things. So um, when did that I start happening, by the way, I'm just curious, mm, approximately, I would probably say about so yeah, the first three years, we were like literally changing staff, changing regimes. So probably like a year before that, the decision was starting to kind of be made to sort of come into what was the popular medium in, you know, in hip hop and R&B and, you know, actually uh, Latin as well. Like Latin music was really um, stepping up because of YouTube and, you know, a lot of artists that work in like these Latinx companies, I mean, countries 
they, you know, have access to YouTube, like Spotify and all those things weren't big there, but everybody had YouTube or for the majority. And so like, they're making amazing video content and getting like a bajillion of views. Like if you look back to early, like uh, was it Bad Bunny and like those type of artists, like we're getting these like hundreds of millions of views and companies are looking like, what is this? <laughs> and so, you know, it, it grew from there. And I think the internet has really made that shift. So I think once music and the internet finally found that like happy medium is when you saw like all these different types of like music really like rise to the forefront and it wasn't your same five artists, you know, every year coming out with the big albums. Yeah. So would you say the future of music right now, at least for the next couple of years is hip hop, R&B and Latin? I would say so. I would say so. I mean, because everything kind of derives from that, you know, like there's, there's, um, let me think, like most of your most popular songs kind of derive from like that kind of hip hop 808 sound, you know, you definitely feel that in Latin music, you know, you feel the hip hop in that too. And it's like this kind of genre and, you know, I'm not a producer, so I can't speak to like what the the sound is but it's like you hear that so like even the big like quote unquote pop songs that I love like have a little bit of like oomph to it you know what I'm saying? there's <laughs> right. something and it's like you know I even think back to Britney Spears and like um mm -hmm. Backstreet Boys and all that like a lot of that I was actually watching the documentary recently all that comes from Sweden actually but <laughs> that's no sort way. of I had no idea from, Oh man, yeah, there's this crazy new series on Netflix, This Is Pop, which is like a really interesting kind of retrospective of like different types of music. Like there's a special on T-Pain huh. and, you know, his kind of use of, um, what is it, the vocoder or? Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, they talk about this, this um, oh man, I'm so bad with names, but uh, not Mark Ronson. What's his name? Martin Garrix? No. But there's like a huge um, just pop sound, like that whole kind of boy band, early 90s to into the two, uh, late 90s into the 2000s sound you know that like crazy? came from this one group in Sweden. You know what's crazy too is that I feel this resurgence of like 90s fashion coming back. And oh, yeah. in that 90s fashion coming back, I'm hearing like 90s music coming back. I mean, if you like go to the mall, Backstreet Boys is playing, Britney Spears is playing you know, and Vogue is playing. And I'm like, yeah. what? <laughs> like, I mean, it was I an like era. It. No it was an era. Like the late nineties to the mid two thousands, like was a great, just like pocket of every different type of genre of music was making this shift into just like a bigger sound, you know, paying more attention to production, paying more attention to songwriting, even if it was like a nonsense boy band song, it was still like catchy, you know, that's why those songs got so big. And again, it was like, right in the beginning of the sharing, I think we're in a little bit of an oversharing moment right now. But um, in the beginning of that, like internet where you could send a song to a friend or, you know, MTV was the end all be all. So people were making huge videos. And it was just like, did you see that video? Did you see that video? Oh, my God, did you see that video? And now I think we're in a place where we're in a little bit of like a, a, a stagnant moment of like, everybody can do it, which that's not really a belief that I have. Like, I think you know, I think people all have talents, you know what I'm saying? Like everybody has a talent and everybody can do it. But I think there's a difference between, you know, a superstar and a really talented person, because there's just something about these like superstars that we see. It's like, it's the reason why we're still looking at Britney Spears and like what's going on with her. It's the reason why like we still care about where Rihanna is, even though she like won't come out of Barbados <laughs> and give right. us a new album. I am so glad that you touched on that because it's something that I've thought about pretty often too everybody can record music, right? Almost everybody has access to record music. And then sort of, I saw this trend of music videos that almost was like homemade videos. Yeah. But then even some of the bigger label artists started doing these sort of homemade looking videos, like, you mm -hmm. know, the Justin Bieber, Ariana Grande video, I think. And like, making it look grainy and making things, you know, not just their video, but I'm talking about like, I saw bigger artists doing videos that almost looked homemade did you did you notice that yeah it was it was a real kind of I think that was sort of the beginning of like streaming really taking off and people kind of like 
we got to fill this space in this space being YouTube. Because yeah. for a while, YouTube was a bit of like the Wild West. I remember when I was first interning at Sony, there was literally one guy in digital and they're like handling everything. And his biggest project was like Daughtry because Daughtry really like always knew how to have a camera on him and like have a whole bunch of content that they would make into these like video, these vlogs, like early vlog days. And he was so excited. He was like, oh, there's traffic we're getting and da da da. <laughs> and to know how that has now turned into like, you know, this massive just platform for whatever, whenever. And so I think these bigger artists to be able to keep up with that type of almost like daily volume, you know, you can't go get Hype Williams every day. You know what I'm saying? Like you can't do this like million dollar, you know, hundred thousand dollar video for everything, but there's still this space where so many people are that you need to capture their attention. So, you know, I know a strategy now is like, you know, for the big singles, it's, it's the big video, but in between, yeah, we'll do like little 10K, 15K type of videos that like don't take a lot more like quote unquote run and gun style, but yeah. um, you know, it's, it's, you gotta fill that space. And if it's a song that's like, maybe not a single, but like, it's really good and we wanna draw attention to it. Like YouTube is a great way to do like a really cool lyric video or do, you know, I have all this BTS content that like, we were always gonna make a video out of it. <laughs> never do. And yeah. then all of a sudden, like you've got this like personal song and it looks great. Let's shoot a quick performance and we can cut to all these like little personal moments. And then like, boom, you've got, you've got this content and then maybe it goes viral and maybe you get like a few million hits on that and like you weren't expecting it so yeah. it's it's a it's definitely a business play and then I think for independent artists it opened up that lane to be like you don't have to be able to call you know whatever production company and huge director if your friend's an upcoming filmmaker you're an upcoming singer songwriter hey can you make a video for me and you know that has turned into you know, I've seen directors spawn whole careers off of that you know if, if you have that talent that will once you get that platform and you know say this song takes off or that artist takes off and you directed their video when they were nobody but it looked really cool and that's a part of the reason why it took off then as a director like there's a whole trajectory there for you sure yeah and then so I think kind of what I'm gathering is you're saying if you're you're kind of gauging it by the song so if the song seems like something personal something kind of cool you'll you'll put out like a lyric video or something that's not a big budget but if you feel like that song has real potential that's when you guys dump the the good budget right for the big yeah. video yeah I mean you know that's that's sort of the the game we play you know it's it's the you look at what the music business is it's it's gambling you know it's like you never know because you're, you're selling creative so yeah. it's sort of like there's already that layer of it, when can we even get the artist to let this baby go? You know what I mean? <laughs> like you, you um, think. And who are like some of the biggest artists at Warner Records right now? Um, I would say right now we've got Sweetie, female rapper, um, NLE Chapa, who like in that young kind of almost phase that we're talking about, like these YouTube kids who have made these videos and these songs who get huge and, you know, turn into a, a massive career, you know, with a major label. Um, I work with Wale, who's just like, almost you know a legend at this point and mm. in the terms of like his just ability to create full albums and full projects still that like touch this this hip-hop community um who else Andre Day you know she's you know incredible <laughs> amazing you know, I know. <laughs> um I'm trying to think off the top of my head uh we just signed um uh Bella Porch, I want to say her name is on the pop side. And again, like from that new generation of, I believe she's huge on like TikTok or something and is now like a pop star, you know, Dua Lipa, same thing. You know, she was a model and, you know, you, you know, I'm sure people were tiptoeing into that, like, uh, but like, I've not, not loved anything that she's put out. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I think yeah, that's, that's, that's to my, my superstar point is like, sometimes people just have that energy like when they want to do something when they want to conquer it if they're focused on it then it's just like they can blow it out of the box do you find that a lot of artists do know what they want visually and conceptually or do you find that your team has to sort of step in and help um and is it easier to work with the artists that sort of can visualize what they want it's definitely easier to work with the artists that can that have that vision um, and I think your bigger artists have that vision, you know, in some shape or form, like it could be just the starting seed, but I, I've seen the, the pattern that 
if you've got at least that seed or if you've got even the end point of where you're trying to get to, like it just makes that journey so much smoother, so much easier. And like, those are usually the artists that I see stand the test of time and, you know, continue to grow because they know, like, they understand that it's, it's a leveling up system. You know what I'm saying? Like you're, not everybody is going to get a hundred million out of the gate out of their first song. But if you get that 500,000 and those 500,000 stay loyal, and then that turns into a million and those millions stay loyal and so on and so on. That's where you get, you know, your Beyonce's, your, you know, everything like that. It's, it's just, it's, it's never a, a one step deal. And right. I think, you know, having that vision and having that sort of like forward thinking attitude are, are the artists that you, you see stand the test of time. I'm curious. Okay. So I'm, I'm just going to bring up like Lil Nas X videos. I'm, I'm seeing this trend now where it's this tons of like CG, really cool scenes and like these, you know, buildings with statues and just <laughs> all this cool stuff. What is, what do you, like, what does it cost to make a video that elaborate? It's a lot. <laughs> like those it's videos, like, yeah, just like an approximate budget for something like that. I'm so curious. I mean, before you're probably, I would say on the production side, because I can't really, every artist and their costs are the same, just depending on, you know, styling and, you know, women with hair and makeup is always more expensive and things like that. But um, I would say on the production side, the more you see these like CGI and huge things, it's, um, you're probably getting up there over 500,000, just because the size of the crew, and especially now, you know, in the times we're in where you know, we're factoring in like COVID testing and all these different things. It's just like a lot goes into the production. So it's like, even if everything was shot on a green or a blue screen, it might take you days to do it because, you know, you've got to set up this one scene and you've got to rehearse it and you've got to do that. And before you know it, you know, that's eight hours in your day gone and you shot like two setups. So now you got another day you're going to go in. And so, you know, just in terms of like crew cost and, you know, the cost of the technology. So editing something like that, again, depending on the timeline that you have can adjust the cost. So if you, if you plan ahead in advance, you can probably not kill yourself in post cost, but if, you know, you're on a deadline that you can't miss, then you know you're looking at rushing and you know adding in more artists because literally something like that is you know either hand drawn or created frame by frame i just did one uh sweetie fast motion and you know that was a live a three-day shoot and you know just about all of it was a, it was a mix between practical sets and then you know filling in the backgrounds for different stunts and stuff but it was like it was a lot. It was awesome though. Like, it was really cool to be a part of that process and like really into like the details and the intricacies of like what it takes in post and pre-production on the shoot day, you know, as, as someone who's been doing videos for so long, like something like that and that big was really cool to kind of like get into what that takes. Cause those are the videos I remember watching as a kid yeah. and you know, I, you don't get to do them that much often. Cause I will say that, you know, to invest like that, it's, it's few and far between like you, I'm sure you can tell like, you know, from like the home homemade sort of style videos to something like that and everything in between, you know, that in between pocket is where a lot of people sit. So when you see something really big like that, like that's, that's the song or that's the artist that, that the art, that the label is really like investing in. Right. Right. And I mean, obviously technology is always changing, always improving. Mm -hmm. um, I have uh, these friends, Jocelyn and Renee, they have a company called AR wall where it's literally mm -hmm. a digital wall behind you so that you're not doing green screen anymore. You actually have the visuals behind as you're going. So it's like real time and the directors can see exactly what's going on rather than visualizing what it could look like. I mean, yeah. are you guys getting into technologies like that. Um, you know, I'm super excited to do something like that. Actually, an artist brought it up uh, a few weeks ago that they had been talking to a studio that could do that. Um, and I, I'm just so excited about like the different technologies that aren't just for movies, you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. these music videos are turning into like mini movies on some cases. And, you know, even seeing the artists getting excited, excited to do something that um, has never been done before, or only a few people have done it, but it's, it's definitely like a time saver. So that's one of the big things that, you know, I'm excited about with things like that. 
during this whole like COVID thing and the, the virtual shows, like a few companies have hit me up about doing these like virtual experience concerts. And like, my mind has gone in a million different directions and like trying to pitch things to artists and like, oh, this could be cool. Let's try this. And like, you're in a space, you can bring your, your fans into this space with you and, you know, connect with them digitally in like all this, you know, missing of concerts and live concerts, you know, thank God those are coming back now, but it's just like, there was a really interesting time where like all these different production companies were like, hey, we've been sitting on this technology with no like real way to use it, but here we are. So let's try something cool. Let's try something different. So it's it's few and far between, but I do think like a lot of, especially artists that are like more of those forward thinking artists are excited and or using that technology. Yeah, I mean, it's good to have have the technology and have a, a, a capacity or an ability to do digital content um, although now that we're kind of seeing the, the backside of COVID, well, maybe, I don't know, there's this Delta variant, but right. like live shows are coming back. And I know that I've been taking advantage of it for sure. I've been going to like two shows a week. Um, <laughs> I know I'm crazy, but it just, I, I miss the energy. I miss seeing live performances. So I'm guessing that maybe other people are feeling the same way I am and like needing and craving that sort of live the live performance, the live version of the performance, but I don't see the digital stuff going away. It's so accessible, you know? Um, what do you think? Yeah. Live shows are back forever or like, are you guys gonna keep pushing down this sort of digital road as well? Yeah, I mean, I don't think you could ever replace a live show. It's like even watching like live concert films and stuff like that is sort of like, it's cool and you wish you were there, but it's still that feeling of like, you wish you were there. So I feel like, this digital aspect won't go away because I think, you know, it opened the door for a lot of smaller acts that didn't necessarily have uh, this type of platform. Like I've seen a few different artists get on like late night TV where it was like the pre-recorded and they realized, oh, we can do more. We can, you know, fill all these different time slots and we can do different types of live performances. So it's given like smaller artists a chance to, you know, pre-tape something and be able to be on like, you know, a Corbin or something like that. And when they wouldn't have been able to, because, you know, oh, is it going to be, is it worth it to fly them to New York to do this little set? Da, 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 da. So I think that aspect of being able to be anywhere is something that I think at least, you know, smart artists will take advantage of. Cause you know, you could have a whole, I don't know, fan base in Australia, but who knows the next time you're going to be able to get to Australia. But if you, you know, even using like that AR wall technology, like you can put together an insane little like live set, 30 minute set that you can live stream and then all of your fans can be there and you can live chat them. And like I saw a friend of mine did, it's really cool that he works with like this, um, I don't even know how to describe her. She's like an acrobatic violinist. You know, wow. even that alone is sort of like, this is the type of thing that needs like a pre-recorded show. Like pink and, with violins? I mean, pretty much, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually the perfect description. But they did this like concert for her. You know, she's got a fan base and they were selling tickets. It was like different price lines for the tickets and like different access for like what's her know, name, by the way, in case anyone uh, wants to Lindsay girl. Sterling. Okay. Um, and so yeah, it was just a really cool, like he sent it to me just as like a hey, look what we did kind of thing. And it was just cool to watch and like to even watch like the business structure of it. It's like, okay, you pay five bucks and you just see the show. You pay 10 bucks and you get a little, you know, you can come early and get the welcome for her. You pay 30 bucks and you know, you get a t-shirt, you know, you get merch and things like that. And, you know, artists who can't move around in tour, I think can still take advantage of that now that people are sort of like into that mindset of like, oh, I can watch a concert. What site does, did she use for that? Because um, I know there's several that offer that type of thing. It sounds like a Patreon thing almost. Yeah, I can't remember. It wasn't, I think they did it actually like through a website that they built or like her standing website and sort of like built out the merch section a little bit or, or like the ticket selling section. Okay. And so you go right there and then you get like a login password mm -hmm. for the, um, for, you know, whatever package that you buy. Cause I know there are, there are websites that, um, you know, for shows, for digital shows that have the same platform. Basically you pay $5, you get this show, you pay $10, you get the show plus a greeting, you, you know, um, so on and so forth. So, yeah. um, I think that's pretty cool, especially for upcoming artists. Yeah. And I think it's, it's a way that, you know, now that people have been, you know, conditioned, so to speak, to be able to like, you know, sit down and bring a concert to their living room, 
then, you know, it, it opens that door and, you know, you can get creative. And I think if you do something cool, you do something you, and you do it well, then, mm-hmm. you know, the people will come and the people will talk about it and you can continue to grow from there. Can we, can we continue on this journey real quick and just go like, do you have advice for, let's say an indie artist who has a very clear vision of what they want to do visually, conceptually, but who has a really low budget, like any tips or tricks or things that are like sort of attention grabbers that, that have worked at least that you know of? I would say it's about focusing the budget that you do have. So if you have a very specific idea you know, you go, you price it out and you, that's actually one thing I'll stop there is like, I feel like you should get different, you know, it's almost like buying a car, like go out, price it out, see what different people can bring to the table, who thinks they can execute it and, you know, have them budget treatment it out for you and look at your different options. And I would say, you know, don't try to overshoot what your budget is. Cause you can see that more than you can see, like not having enough budget if that makes sense so it's like say I want to do something that has a whole but that needs a whole bunch of green screen and I do it anyway and the green screen looks horrible Uh you know you can see that way faster than it's like okay I can't do green screen but like this guy says that he could do it if like we could do projections on a white wall behind me and it's not exactly the same but like it's a cool effect and it looks good in the second scenario, people will just see a really cool video with projections. They won't see, oh, you tried to do green screen, but obviously you didn't have the talented person <laughs> or the budget to do the green screen right. Yeah. So yeah. I would say, you know, be open to different ways to execute an idea. Because, you know, I think the same way as you're putting a song together, like very rarely, I'm, I'm thinking <laughs> very rarely is it like the first way it was in your brain you know what I mean oh, no. like there's you, plenty of versions exactly of songs before they become what you actually see but I think my question was more designed on like do you see any trends for like 2021 for independent artists to use in their visual content that work I mean, you know, we had, we had the Lady Gaga era, the whole shock value thing, which I think still works, but I mean, Mm -hmm. any other like trends or like attention grabbers that really do move the needle and like get, get viewers that you can recognize as being trends for, for this year? I would say shock still works, always works. Um, And I think shock with, with meaning behind it, you know what I mean? Like, I think just shock for the sake of shock is a little bit campy at this point. But if it like has something to do with the song or if like it's a bait and switch kind of thing, like, you know, this is what the the thumbnail is. And then once you click it and the video has nothing to do with that, but it's good and you watch it, you know, that's actually one thing that our digital team tells us all the time that like literally the thumbnail image that you choose can change your uh, view count by like, I think it's like 10% or something like that. What's the best thumbnail to have then? It should be a clear image of the Mm -hmm. artist or a very interesting, colorful, eye-catching image. Um, and if it's like a lyric video or something, it should be like, really, you should show like the best kind of text with the title and things like that. Um, but basically like attention grabbing. So So it's not necessarily a scene from the video, but a different sort of thumbnail that's clear um, where you can see the artist, it may be colorful. Yeah, because if the video is like a little bit abstract and there's really no still that like makes sense on its own, then, you know, shoot something that you know you want it to be the thumbnail or like have it have an image that or like a cool logo. If your logo is really dope and your fans know what to look for when they see that, you know, anything that really like makes people either recognize you or want to just see what this is so like okay so shock value but with meaning behind it um yeah. not to put you on the spot but can you think of any sort of example of, of what you mean by that um I mean I think back to your point on little Nas X it's like everything you do if you look at it at uh, everything he does if you look at it at surface value it's like oh he's just doing that for shock value he's just doing that to remind you you know that he's black and he's gay and it's just sort of like no, when you really listen to the songs or you kind of go back and watch the videos for another time, you see like what he's talking about or you hear the lyrics and everything starts to sort of come together. And, you know, me as a fan of music, like I respect that. Like if I see it, if you get me with the with the shock value and there's nothing really behind it, then that's sort of like the taste you're going to leave in my mouth. It's like, oh, this is just like someone who does things for attention and maybe the song's good, maybe it's not. But if like 
I look at you as like a complete artist who, when I look back and I see like once the, you know, once the merch comes and once the video comes and then I really listen to the song and then maybe I see a live performance and that same kind of theme is happening, you know, it, it really starts to make sense and like build this profile of who you are as an artist. And so I think he does a really great job of that because I'm even guilty of being like, yeah, what is this? Or like, you know, I get it, I respect them, but like, this isn't just, this music isn't for me. But then I'll hear the song like in the world somewhere and kind of be like, actually, this is kind of a bop. Like, <laughs> yeah, I like this song. And then, you yeah. know, you hear the lyrics and, you know, this, so then that's, I think he, for especially for his generation, does a really great job of like shock with intent. Yeah, no, shock with intent, yes. I love that. Yeah. Exactly. And so, um, hmm, what was I going to say? Oh, so for an artist that doesn't know, like the, not the little Nas X's of the world, but for an <laughs> artist that doesn't really know what they want visually, how do you sort of guide them? Um, I like to start with really myself getting into the song. And then from there, sort of like present a few different options, even if it's down to like what I'm going to say to directors as I'm pitching the song. So it's like, I'll listen to it for a little bit, see what I hear, see what the lyrics are saying and, you know, pitch back to the artist like, oh, I think for this one, like it could be really cool if like this is a really like intimate personal performance from you. And, you know, it, your focus, obviously it won't just be you, but like 80% of the video is like, focused on you and you like delivering this message, you know, straight from your heart. And sometimes they'll be into me like, mm, that's not really what the song is about. It's kind of more me talking to somebody or it's somebody else's point of view. And I don't want to really put it on me like that. It's like, okay, so now that I have full context, I might go back and pitch another idea. It's like, oh, well, what if, you know, it's this story. And then at the end, we find out that it's you, that it's somebody talking to you and that's what it's all. And, you know, we take that very like loose, loose nugget and then I'll go to directors who, you know, this is their job is to kind of visualize what a song could be. And so they'll write out a full treatment, you know, based on that little nugget. So I'll say, you know, the artist really does want this to be performance based. You know, they love the color yellow and um, it's, it's a personal song. Like it's a very personal song. And from there, the director can pull from their whole, whole creative spectrum and kind of narrow it down into something that could fit. And so then I'll take maybe like my top three to five treatments back to the artist. And from there, it usually helps them shape more of a vision because then they start to kind of see maybe parts of what somebody might nail it, or they might be like, okay, this is sort of close, but can we try this? Can we try that? And from there, like the conversation sort of evolves into what the final video is. Yeah. So it's really just about, I guess it was a long-winded way of saying, you know, you just kind of give them options. You know, like yeah. sometimes you might not know exactly how to verbalize it, but once you see it, then it's like, okay, yes, that's it. Or that's close, but let's, you know, tweak it a little further. So let me ask you, like, we know the best case scenario, the artists who know what they want, who are, are focused and, and everything, but like, what's the worst case scenario? Like, what's the worst type of artist to work with? Indecisive. Really? So like, if you're indecisive, it's really hard to kind of know what's right. Because at the end of the day, you know, it's the artist that's in front of the camera. Like, I can get... I won't say hundreds, but it's like, I can get a bunch of ideas and you can just close your eyes and pick one and show up on the day. And nine times out of 10, it'll kind of feel like that, you know? Like, or if you, cause you didn't really want to do it or you didn't really pay attention until you were there. And so maybe we spend the whole day like trying to change what we can change. But, you know, once you're kind of on the set, you're on the set. So it's like, it's, it's, we have what we plan for. So, you know, there's always a little bit of wiggle room, but if like you came in sort of like not really feeling it or not really like saying what you didn't like or what you did like, and everybody's trying to guess, and then we put you in front of the camera and say, okay, go and love it. <laughs> that's just kind of going to be written all over the artist's face. So I would rather like go back and forth a hundred times and get an idea that like, I know that the artist is confident in and excited about rather than like sort of just, well, we said we were gonna shoot on this day and this is the idea we can get done in that day. So let's all just show up and see what happens. Right, right. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And um, so like, I know that you aren't an a &R, but do you have any sort of um, 
idea of how artists get to be signed at, at Warner Records? I mean, like, I remember way back in the day, there were scouts, right? And they would see people perform. And now I feel like that sort of shifted to if you have a digital presence, uh, right? Or an internet presence yeah. now. And, and that seems to be almost more important than the performance. But then I've also heard from people working at labels that signing all these TikTok stars, YouTube people, people with giant followings, they, they get into the label and then they realize that maybe they can't perform or they... Um, they don't write their songs or I don't know. Do you, do you see like avenues for like how, how people get signed these days and how, you know, what happens once they get there? Yeah. I mean, to answer the first part of your question, how artists get signed, I don't know, but I do know there's a lot of factors that go into it. And definitely digital presence is a huge part of it because at the end of the day, you know, it is the music business and, you know, record labels make money from selling music. Unfortunately, these days, music is sold, quote unquote, via streaming. And, you know, as we all know, it's a fraction of the revenue that it was when we were buying $16 full CDs. And, you know, that also kind of opens the door for things to be a little bit more singles based than like full album based, because, you know, again, back in the day, you got a hot single and then you go buy the album kind of regardless, you know what I mean? It's sort of like, that's my next thing I'm giving you is the full album. So you kind of generate these fans because you're going to listen to a full project because you have to, you bought it. And it's the only thing once you put it in your player that you can listen to. But now when you open Spotify, it's literally everything in the world. So is so, it more important to be popular than to be good? Because if you're popular, then you get signed and then you have a whole team to make sure that you're good. <laughs> I wouldn't say more important. I would definitely say it's probably easier to get signed if you're popular. But if we're talking longevity, I haven't seen anybody who has been able to just like withstand on popularity, you know, especially in these days of like, what was it, the SoundCloud rappers and stuff like that. Like that was an era where it felt like literally everybody and anybody was getting a record deal. And it, so it was like, okay, but then when you really, look at that landscape it was one or two songs from these people so it was just sort of like as a label as an investment it's sort of like one or two songs is only going to go so far unless it was like Gangnam style you know what I mean <laughs> and then you know as as an artist one or two songs like I do always joke that's like you just need one hit to last you a lifetime but as an artist, I can't assume, I can't think that that's fulfilling, you know what I'm saying, to just have one song and you're always yeah, doing that longevity. one song, <laughs> exactly, yeah. like imagine performing the same song for the rest of your life and people only wanting to hear that one song, like I'll hear, it, I'll listen to the rest, it's like, okay, you put out five other albums, sure, play right. me that song, that's what I'm here for, oh my so, God. you know, I, I don't see long careers that come off of just popularity alone, but, you know, if you have the talent to back it up, it sort of just kind of goes back to what it always was. Like, did you catch my eye as an A&R? And if so, why? Was it the numbers? Okay, let's hope the talent backs up these numbers. Or, you know, did you, did I just hear this raw talent that I want to try and cultivate and bring to life? It's way harder for the raw talent because we just live in a fast paced world. Like literally TikTok is what, 10 seconds, 15 seconds. And this is what people are consuming as content. Even in, <laughs> in those 15 seconds, the TikTok's better if there's all these edits. <laughs> exactly. And it's just like, and I can't even like take away from people who like do really good TikTok. I don't really, I'm not like on TikTok a lot, but I remember what was the the, the first one that was like the 10 second loop thing. Um, oh uh, gosh, what was it called? Not Snapchat, the other one, whatever. I know, I know which one you're talking uh, But it's just like, even like- <laughs> <laughs> it's been that long <laughs> right I feel like it was like five years ago but whatever see fast-paced world but um, but yeah so it's, anyway TikTok it's just like people who do really good TikTok videos do really good TikTok videos and it's like that's a skill and that's a talent it's not a talent that like has been around for a hundred years but it's like it's derived from things that have been around that means they're a really great editor or they're a really engaging performer or, or know, they're whatever just creative the, in general just, sometimes I'm like how do people come up with these in, insanely funny 
edits and, and yeah. videos. Like I couldn't think of that. Exactly. And I'm just like, Hey, I'm all for somebody getting the shot. Like if I see you, let's say let's keep it in content. So let's say like this TikTok star, like makes super dope edits and gets, you know, millions of views on everything they edit. And it's like, Oh, I want to be a movie director. And it's just like, okay, this is 10 seconds. You now have to keep somebody's attention for two hours. Like that's a big leap. Yeah. And like, maybe you can do it. And maybe that talent is in you innately. And TikTok was just the launch pad to get your name out there. Because again, we live in a society where it's like, your name is out there. And oh, if I can attach you to this many millions of people, then of course, here's money to do whatever you want to do. And, you know, mm-hmm. plug my brand in there while you're at it. But if you are given that opportunity to make that movie and it's horrible, like, I don't think we should all be surprised because it's like, we know you for making 10 second TikTok videos. Why would we assume that you can make a two hour movie? But it's just sort of like, I think as long as you have the talent to kind of back up this, this, um, this, this, uh, what is the word I want to use? This ability to like engage people and, and get these followers and get people to engage with you, then, you know, I'm all for it. I'm all is for it. Is there any real way to platform. test, to test that? I mean, to gamble somebody who's, who's done a 15 second TikToks and has had a lot of success. And then is there any real test to see if they'd be capable of doing something like a two hour film? I kind of think that's the problem that there's no really like testing ground anymore, which I think no resume. Was, like, yeah, like what it's, what would have been artist development? Like if you see somebody in a club, there's no way to know that they can put an album together, but like if that voice is amazing and the 10 song or the, let's say you hear six songs in a set and four of them are good, that you could kind of gamble that they've got a few more and that if they are put with the right producer or writer that they could put together a really great album. And then from there, you know, you put the album out and you put all the machine behind it and you hope that it does well. You know, sometimes it doesn't, or sometimes only a hundred thousand people think that it's great. And you thought it was going to be a hundred million people that would think it was great. Mm-hmm. And it could be, that was the test. And it's like, we have to tweak these couple things and try this a little different. And then the next album, you know, you hit it at the park and you know, you've got a, a budding superstar, you know, you look at the artist um, H.E.R. and she's been around forever and has just been having this hit in the last three or four How years. How has she been around forever? Isn't she only like 21? She got signed when she was 12 years old. Oh my gosh. She I has idea. been signed and in the music industry since she was 12 years old. Wow. Wow. And it's I like, she's, she's an so amazing, yeah, she's an amazing instrumentalist. She's an amazing songwriter. She's an amazing singer, but it just took time for her moment to catch up with her. And it just took the right amount of like the team sticking with it, the label sticking with it, you know, just people believing in this talent and being like, it's not that you're not talented. Something's just not right yet. And we're going to stick with it until it's right. And not everybody gets that opportunity. Can I touch on, on, on something, um, you know, regarding getting signed and all that? Um, let's talk about like ageism a little bit. Do you see artists that are like in their thirties getting signed or is it mostly young kids? Like I mostly see like, you know, between like 15 and 25, is that still, is that still sort of a rule of thumb or like are older artists getting signed as well? I don't know if it's a rule of thumb, but it's definitely, I, I would say it's the majority, you know, and it's, you know, pop music, popular music is quote unquote, like a young game and they're, they're aiming at 15 year olds. So I I guess the assumption is that, you know, you can speak to your audience the best, but you also deal with like that 15 year old turning 17, 18, turning 16, 17, 18, and going through that weird, awkward phase. And then like not knowing what to do with that. And so it's just like, okay, you sign this young person. They do a great job. They have a great head. All the, let's say it's a, you know, it's a young male singer and like all the girls love them and blah, 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 blah. But then like that voice starts to change or that mustache starts to grow in awkwardly or like, you know, same with the female artist. It's just like, oh, the voice starts to change or the body starts to get awkward. And you're literally going through pu- puberty or growing up or whatever is happening. Yeah. And, you know, we're a pretty vain society. So it's, it's, it's judged and it's hard to watch that. And it's, you weren't like you were a year ago and all these different things. And so you have that on the younger side. And then speaking to like older artists who are a lot of artists really like hit their stride in that 26 to 32 kind of window, because, you know, as a human, that's sort of when you hit your stride as a human. So it's like, there's more to write about. There's more, like, it's a deeper, if you're a writer, it's like a deeper lyrics or like you understand music more. You find hey, you're not going to change yourself. physically at that yeah. point. You're, you're, you are who you are. 
exactly and so it's like I've seen both like I've worked with artists who were you know 30 or turning 30 or people being like "Ooh, they're over 30 to over 25 like is this gonna work and it worked and there's other things where it's like it hasn't worked and it hasn't been because of the age it's been other things or maybe like people made assumptions because of the age and it hasn't worked so I, I see it and I, I understand that there's like definitely a frustration there because like I've worked with artists who have been in that pocket who I'm just like, yo, people just hear this. If you take all this like superficial stuff out of the conversation and you just hear this or you just see this, like you're gonna love it. But you know, there's there's always powers that be. And when we talk about this whole game being a gamble, it's like there's, there's people gambling with their with their investments, with their company. So it's like, is this gonna work? How many times has it worked before? Like all that stuff kind of factors in. So like it's it's definitely skews toward younger artists for sure but you know it's it's the game and you you know it happens in movies it happens in tv like you know it's 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 this it's just us I guess as a society <laughs> like I don't know um we have a thing about growing up I guess I don't know what yeah. it is <laughs> well, I mean you've got the artists like the Gwen Stefani's and the JLo's of the world and the Madonna's of the world sort of redefining what it what it means to be an older woman and to still be sexy and to still yeah. be able to perform and so I just I wonder if you know the older like like let's say like the 35 year old girls like are they still getting a chance you know like to get their music out there and to be signed yeah I mean I think so but I think it's sort of that that sort of um you know, need to, to show and prove and almost be like 10 times better, you know, than, than the younger girls. But I think that is kind of changing. And that's one of the things that I do accredit, like, you know, internet and this sort of like world of, of accessibility where you can see like the JLo's and I mean, even like Beyonce, like it's like, you see how you can grow up in this industry and still be sexy, still be, you know, talented, you know, above all you know, still be hardworking, still be able to show up, you know, especially for women, have kids and not feel like it's the end of the world. It's just like, yo, there's women out here who have kids all the time and go back to work. Like, just because I'm a singer or an actress or whatever, doesn't mean like I shouldn't be able to go back to work because I've had a baby. Um, so I, I think that, you know, that side and that more like personal and lifestyle of people being exposed more, being, you know, through people's like personal socials and things like that, you know, has allowed that mentality to kind of shift a little bit. And I do see, you know, a lot of artists might not like say their age, but when you find out, it's like, oh, and that's dope. It's, it's like, wow, I'm excited to see that. Or for me, I'm like, you know, oh, now I understand why I connect to you more because it's just like, you make sense. You know, I, I enjoy this music. I enjoy what you're saying. I'm enjoying, you know, your, your wherewithal to like play with words in a certain way, you know, play with the music in a certain way because you've done all the obvious stuff that you would do when you're 20 something. But now it's like, you know, you're settled into who you are and who you want to be. And like, that's usually when the music or really any art in general, like gets better. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I know that, you know, teenagers are probably the biggest consumers of new music, mm -hmm. but I wonder if that will change a little bit or has been changing a little bit as like, you know, I see, you know, chicks on TikTok who are like 50 and they're just, they've got like the hardest, like Southern rap going. I'm like wondering if maybe there's a trend um, for like, you know, the over 35 crowd actually like being receptive to new music. I see it all the time. And I'm guessing like, are they sort of factored into the demographic more of people who actually do consume new music? I think they are. And especially now where you can like get such an accurate read on who's consuming your music, you know, right. and where they're consuming it from and how they're consuming it. Like if you really want that information, it's out there. Um, for the most part, I think. <laughs> yeah, but, for the most um, part. Like even my like my Spotify for artists, I can see, you know, um, what their age was, what country they live in, who's who's really, you know, streaming. Uh, your yeah. song because it's like I um a couple years ago we were on vacation and you know my wife and I kind of put my mom onto Spotify and 
I could kind of see it in her that she was sort of like, you know, why would I ever do this? Like, I have my CDs in my car. It's the only place I listen to music. And it's like, well, that's because that's the only place you're allowing yourself to listen to music. Like she had had, and I think she did get up to an iPod, I will say. I'll give her that much credit. So she had like the iPod. Sounds like my mom, actually. <laughs> like she had a little iPod speaker in the house and then she would mm-hmm. bring that into the car or whatever. But I think it just, you know, it's easier to just sort of hit the radio, hit play and not have to, you know, plug in or figure out my Bluetooth. But once we kind of just showed her like how easy it was and we were like, it's not just our music on here. Like you can, I was like, search any artist you love. <laughs> and it's like, she's fine. It's like, she's sending me playlists that she's made now. And it's just like, so I think once that door is open, people understand because like a lot of people in like the older de- demographic they like um more of like that passive listening experience so almost like a pandora kind of thing mm-hmm. where it's like you have the control to say oh i like that i didn't like that and it curates it for you um whereas like a spotify or apple music it's more about you going to find what you want to listen to and like finding a specific album or artist um but i think once that door is kind of open for people to realize like how easy it is to discover new music you know they're into it yeah i agree um i remember showing my mom spotify as well and she was like (laughs) (laughs) she was all into it um All right. Well, look, I mean, I could talk to you all day. I I love all the things you have to say and I'm getting so much cool info. This is fun. Well, I just kind of want to want to see like if you have advice specifically for people that want to do what you do. So create content, upcoming um, music video directors. um, Any advice for them? Yeah, Um, I will say, you know, I didn't even know that this type of job existed at a label, you know, as much as I loved music videos and was always like watching kind of, excuse me, behind the scenes things and stuff like that. I never thought that there was somebody like at the label sort of like in charge of making sure it all happens. Because when you think about it, like it's a lot that needs to happen for like a music video to come together. Um, And so I'll, that's my one thing is like on the business side, you know, if you don't feel like you want to be a director, you want to be, you know, a photographer, you know, an editor, anything like that. Like there are positions, even if it's not like in the label role, you can look at production companies and be a producer, work your way up to executive producer. Cause like, that's a specific skill. That's a specific talent where like you do merge the creative and the business and you have to figure out how to be that creative problem solver. Um, up and coming creatives, I think you just you just have to create. Like there's so many platforms for you to not need anybody to put yourself out there and to put your work out there that you just have to consistently do it. And I don't want to say that as if it's easy because it's not. Um, you know, it, it takes a lot. Like we were talking about those TikTok videos earlier. Like I know it's 10 seconds of viewing, but I could imagine they spend like 10 hours just trying to put together these little things and make it seem like it's it's nothing. Mm-hmm. And so I would say if it's something that you love and it's something that you want to do and it's something that you want to get paid for, then you have to understand that you have to come to the table with the portfolio. So, you know, if you walk in and you've done one really great video that, albeit it's great, there's no way to, for anybody to tell that you can do it again, you know, or like what it is your voice is or what your point of view is, because there's directors that I go through, go to specifically for their style. So it could be like any genre of music, but it's like, hey, this artist is looking for like a really great um, portrait style video. And I know a few directors that do that great. Or this artist is looking for that in the club. I need all the twerking. I need all the crazy laser lights. And I know the directors to go to for that. So I think, you know, establish your voice, establish your point of view and just be consistent. And don't be afraid to put yourself out there and put out the early stuff because you can always take it down and you can always, you know, show it or use it to show your growth. You know, it's like, this is where I started, but I was trying to do this. And now that I've kept doing it and kept practicing, like now, this is what I do. This is my look. And even for you to look back on your own stuff and like look for growth and, and just be consistent in who you are and have that vision and don't be afraid, even if it's different, because it's always the different ones that seem to pop out five and 10 years later that I was like, oh my God, this is the biggest yeah. director ever. <laughs> or Because everybody's looking for the thing that they've never seen before. That's so it's good. hard to put yourself out there and you're the only one doing it because, you know, we, we're, we're a people of everybody do the same thing. But, um, you know, if you're, if you're beaten to that different drum, like somebody's going to hear it. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And I can't, I can imagine that having a degree in the music business or a business degree in general helps, you know, a hundred percent. That's actually a great point. Like, don't be afraid to study it. Like go to art school, you know, and then take a photography course. If you're doing something else and you know, you have to do this to get paid, but you love photography, be a great photographer. And if that means learning, then you have to learn. Like, that's my one thing is like, never stop learning, never stop in whatever you do. You know what I'm saying? Never stop wanting to be better because that's what people want. They want the best they want, or they want you to be at your best. Like if I come to you, I don't want you to be in the same place that you were five years ago. Like, even if like, you know, your style is the same, but like, where's the growth and where's the evolution and even just like getting comfortable in it. Like I'd look at it like um, choreography, you know, like you do the same routine, a hundred times, the hundredth time is way different than the 50th time. Even if the 50th time was great, the hundredth time, like when you feel it, when you can do it without even thinking about it, oh, yeah. like that's when you're putting on a show. That's the magic. That's it. <laughs> that's great <laughs> so it's advice. Just like never, never be afraid to learn. And then once you do like never stop learning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so what's next for you? What's next for Akila? <sighs> what is next? You know, I, um, I'm being at Warner, being at Warner for a while. I'm excited. Like we've got some some cool things on the horizon, you know, between different art, new artists that we're signing and, you know, artists that I've been working with in these last four years where everything's starting to like come together and like it feels real. Um, I'm really excited to kind of go down that road, you know, outside of that. I just want to dive more into like content creation and content that deals with music and, you know, maybe get into TV and movies, but keep it like, music focused and really like I just continue to to pursue my passion for music and how to bring music to life visually you know so you know I've looked at um what's it called um not scoring but sort of like um music supervision and things like that and like placing the right songs in the right spaces or like using music creatively in film and tv so just exploring more of that and you know moving out here from New York has been able to like let me kind of dive into that world a little bit deeper and like meet different people and you know be able to like see what this whole you know film world is about so that's exciting and well aren't you involved in some side projects too like I heard you were working on a series a little bit yeah a friend of mine who's actually a director you know he wrote this really cool series and uh we're kind of like pitching it around kind of see see who might be interested it's sort of like futuristic hip-hop kind of like this like underground crazy like what the near future could look like so Ooh, and it's, it's an interesting twist on it so it should be cool yeah it's like it kind of brought me in and kind of started just super organically and he just like wanted my opinion and just kind of kept coming back and so he was like you want to kind of be a part of this so so I was like, yeah why not let's try something different so it's sort of like consulting on that and sort of helping to like bring the story alive and sort of see where it goes and see what the next steps on that could be so that's an exciting me. Well, I've got my fingers crossed that somebody really cool, a really cool network picks it up for you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, cool. So I'm going to post your socials below. Do you want to just okay. tell everyone where they can follow you and what you're up yeah. to? Yeah. I mean, mainly IG, you know, I've been uh, Akila Robinson. Um, I just changed it. So it's not so confusing. <laughs> I have, like a weird handle. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm mostly on Instagram, you know, um, dabble in Twitter a little bit. I think it's uh, Akila 25 but um okay yeah well I'll post them I'll post them below um and then you know maybe we can do this again in five years and see where you're at (laughs) oh I like that yeah it's like where it's been versus where it's going (laughs) we're growing (laughs) growing and learning and becoming experts and way better at what we do yes yes well thank you so much sorry no you go ahead I was going to say, I'm sure I'll be after like an array of like superstar people you've had on this podcast. So yeah, I can come back. (laughs) Yeah, that's the goal. (laughs) Well, again, thank you so much um, for being on the show. It was lovely chatting with you. Um, Thanks for sharing, you know, all the information you shared. And, and is there anything else you want to add before we sort of wrap up? Um, no, this is great. This is really fun. You know, I hope that whoever needs to hear this, hears this and, you know, get some good advice. Um, it's funny. I was actually on my computer stacked up on some like very dope music business books <laughs> that I kept from college, you know what I'm saying? So just, um, just keep seeking information, you know, be it in a book, be it in a podcast like this, just be it in conversation, you know, mm-hmm. I just feel like that's, that's how we pass information on the best. So I love doing things like this. 
That's awesome. Well, I'm sure a lot of people will, will get a lot from this. So I, I really appreciate that. Awesome. Um, all right. Well, hey, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. You too. You too. It's hot <laughs> one out here. It's like 90 degrees already. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no one's leaving the house. <laughs> no. We both live in LA. However, we did this virtually just so everybody knows because, um, you know, we're trying to be distanced and safe. Yes. Uh, yeah. So enjoy the rest of your Sunday. And um, I'm sure we'll we'll be chatting soon. Absolutely. Bye, Akila. Bye. Thank you.